Thank you, Rabbi Hadjaf, for your inspirational words of wisdom. Good evening, everyone. Welcome back. Um, that was a quick one second uh, break between one speech to another because you guys are on a marathon of classes and ideas tonight. Mechila. If you need to take a moment to run out, go for it. Um, my topic tonight is called It's About Time. And um, before I begin, I just want to share like a little thought that I had. I, every year, Pesach comes along and you want to find new ideas. So I'll go out and I'll buy a new Haggadah. So I'm, when I go to the store, I'm always torn. Do I get a Sephardic Haggadah? Do I get an Ashkenazi Haggadah? You know, I want to learn from everybody. So this year I got an Ashkenazi Haggadah. And every year I try to find something new that I learn about. So I got this new Haggadah and I open it up to the beginning. And um, it explains that there's an Ashkenazi custom of wearing something called a kittel. Right? And the kittel is this white robe that Ashkenazim wear. And um, it gives like all these different explanations as to why they wear a kittel at the, the uh, setter table. One of them has to do with the fact that, you know, this might be your last meal. You know, you're sitting there and like you're in your burial shreds. The same thing that, you know, Ashkenazim wear a kittel on the day that they get married. And on the day that they, on, on, on uh, Yom Kippur, on Pesach, apparently, I didn't know that. And on the day that they die, it's the same garb. They're wearing it all the time. So they, they wear it because they're also thinking about the resurrection of the dead. And I'm thinking like, can you imagine like starting a meal, being reminded of the end? Like you're starting this whole entire, this, this, this a day of, uh, of happiness, a day of, uh, of freedom, a day of redemption by remembering you know, this past. Now it happens to be, I'm not, this is not uh, in any way meant to be a, a, a ranking on any Ashkenazi customs at all. God forbid, I love Ashkenazi. My mother-in-law is Ashkenazi. I really love her. And now she is, and I love her deeply. I love you, Ma. And, uh, but I just think it's, it's, it's interesting that like every different Eida has so many different beautiful customs for me. I'm just happy to having rice, you know, and having my colorful, you know, garb out, and so on and so forth. So with that, let's just let's just start. Okay. So um, the we just we just passed Shabbat Gadol. It's gone. And Machachamim um, asked the question: What does why do we call it Shabbat Gadol? The big, the great Shabbat. And we're told that when our people were in the land of, Israel, of Egypt, they were asked to take a little lamb and tie it onto their doorpost. They were asked to do this on the 10th of Nisan. And then on the 14th of Nisan, Erev Pesach, they had the Korban Pesach, which was the sacrifice of this lamb. And then they left, they left Egypt. And the question everyone, everyone asks is, why, why wait four days? Why bring a lamb into the house for four days? Okay, I know you like shawarma, you want lamb shawarma, and you want to massage it, you know, you want your wagyu shawarma beef, and you're doing your thing with it for four days. But like, why, why do you have to do that? Like, just, just tell them that on the 14th in the day, wake up early, like before sunrise, come up with some law, and say at that time, you'll take out the lamb and you'll do it, prepare it. But why hold on to the lamb in their house? And why tie it onto their bedposts? <clears throat> so, I saw a few answers, but one in particular I'm going to share very quickly because this is like a little bit of a segue into a bigger piece that I, I don't want to lose you with. The idea is that the lamb was the god of the Egyptians, right? He was the, the god of the Egyptians, and therefore Moses is told, commanded by God to tell the Jewish people to bring in this little lamb into the house to remind them that there's nothing godly about this lamb, right? Not only that, you're going to eat it. And the miracle wasn't the fact that they were going to eat it. The miracle was the fact that the Egyptians who witnessed their God being dragged into their homes said nothing about it. They chose not to intervene. This is at the end. They already witnessed the nine plagues. They weren't touching the Jews. That was even more miraculous. And that's why it's called the Shabbat Gadol. They're bringing this thing into their house and they're, they're ready to have this massive experience. They're holding it there four days. But that doesn't explain why four days. So the four days I saw was that Habits are very difficult to break. It's really hard. And so even though intellectually they knew that God existed, that he was there, there was something other force that was driving them out of Egypt, it still takes time to break a habit. So they had to spend four days living with an animal in their home, in their bedroom, reminding themselves every single moment that it's nothing but an animal. It wasn't enough to say, just do it early in the morning and go out and you'll be free. Sometimes we need to spend time processing things. You can't rush. You can't run through a moment in time and expect everything to make sense. So many of us have so much post-traumatic stress because we just run through life. We don't spend enough time absorbing the events that we've, went, we've, we've gone through, we've experienced. 
So God is saying right here, you were slaves for so long in Mitzrayim. You were, this concept has been, has been so etched into your mind. It's such a part of your essence and your being. You can't just rush out. With this, you need to spend some time and allow it to settle. Take a break, relax. Absorb this moment in time. Which is interesting because this concept of slowing down and absorbing is the exact opposite of the Passover experience. I'm not sure about you, but right now, my heart is beating a little bit faster than normally. Not just because I'm speaking, because I know how much I need to do, how many things I need to prepare. You know, Rabbi Farhi, who's here right now, you know, and he's sitting so calmly in the back preparing, he's moving today and tomorrow. And he's got Pesach coming up, and he's got classes to prepare. We're not operating in normal time, uh, time frames. Like if, we, this, if, if, if I could, I could show you that I'm operating at like 1.75 speed right now. Everything I'm doing is moving much faster. I feel like everything around me is moving much faster, and I don't know how to slow it down. And I just can't wait to experience Passover because I just want to get out of this time of moving so fast. But we know that one of the major mitzvot of Pesach is eating matzah. And what do we call matzah? We call it lechem oni, poor man's bread. And no, it's not called poor man's bread because it's so expensive. When you buy it, you have left with no money, right? It's called poor man's bread because there's something that was missing about the experience of the bread itself. Now, when someone goes to jail, we call that doing time, right? Matzah is a very unique expression of bread. Right? What's it missing? It has all the ingredients of bread. It's missing one essential component. It's called time. Anyone here ever go to a matzah bakery? Okay, first of all, if you've, ever, if you've never been to the matzah bakery, you have to go. It's too late probably at this point to find one that will let you in. But if you haven't been to one next year, if you remind me, I will organize one for the Knesset to go because it is a fascinating experience. You're going to go to the, one of these matzah bakery places, okay? Everything is covered, okay? You have this, uh, you have a, a very clear system where people are getting the dough, pinching the dough, rolling the dough, making sure it's really thin. And then you have these, you have a clock, Okay, and you literally have people taking the rolled out dough and running into the oven before 18 minutes because after 18 minutes it starts to rise, it's machmit, it's exp it expands, and that makes it chametz, you can't eat it anymore. So literally the whole entire process is about moving things super, super fast. So what's happening is that you're eating something that is symbolically something that overcomes time. You're eating something that's called beyond time. So, well, if, if that's the case, then what's so, what is the deeper significance about why we have to move so fast? Like, what's the big deal? Just make a matzah that is super, whatever it is, make it like a, you know, do something else. Like, what is this idea of needing, needing to create a process of running through something? And why do, why do we need to have the matzah itself as, eat something that expresses this unique expression of time? Now, we also know this idea that the Jewish people, one of the reasons why we had matzah is because they didn't have time to, to, to bake bread properly. They had to leave Kehar and it was immediate. They had to get out of Egypt because one more second, they would have stayed there for one more moment. What would have happened? The Chachamim say they would have reached the 50th level of Tumah, the 50th level of impurity. And once you reach that level, you can never get out. Right? This has always bothered me. Like, well, what's the big deal? Like, the Jewish people just saw some of the greatest miracles ever. Right? And if they saw all those massive miracles, how could they still be on the 49th level of impurity that for one more moment they would have been locked in Egypt forever? Does that bother you? They just saw 10 of, 10 of the greatest miracles ever, right? They're about to leave. They didn't see the splitting of the Yamsuf, right? But they still saw 10, pla 10, 10 plagues in Egypt. Shouldn't that have been enough to break their psychological you know, grab that Egypt had on their minds? And the answer is no, it wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. They needed something much more profound. So, now, wouldn't it have been a greater miracle if God said, just relax, take it easy. You guys were slaves for so long. What's the rush? We're going to do a small chag. You're going to have a nice seven-course meal. We're going to have some shawarma. And we're going to move from shawarma. We're going to have different kinds of shawarma. And you're going to relax. We're going to have a slow process. You know, you, uh, if, if, I don't know about you. For me, as a child, my memories of Pesach were, you know, watching the Charlton Heston, uh, the Charlton Heston rendition of the Haggadah at the table. That was our auditory explanation of the Haggadah. And we'd watch it together, and we'd dip the matzah, and like we'd sell stories and whatever it is. And like, but like you're rushing, you, you're like, you want to fast forward, you don't want to, I saw this already 10 times, I don't want to watch it anymore, right? You just want to get to the food and, and finished. 
And there's a drawn out process, right? But Mitzrayim itself, the experience of leaving was super fast. Why did God want that for us? Why did the leaving of Egypt be slow, just like the Karban Pesach? Why did it have to go fast? Now, I don't know about, I, I remember as a kid often being, you know, dragged to places that I did not want to go. And for me, I always hated shopping. Nothing's changed. I still don't like shopping. I never liked shopping. And so my mom would take me out and we'd go to the mall. And I'd have to find things as she's going, you know, through her stores and buying her stuff. I'd have to find different ways of, you know, killing the time or making the most of a, of a, of a, of a difficult situation. So often, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of look forward at some point going to the mall because I had those escalators and they were so cool. You know, and like you would stand by the escalator and you see the escalators going down and you've always wished if you could, what would happen if you run up on an escalator that's going down. So I was the kid that was always running up a down, a down moving escalator. And you realize after you're running up, the, you've done it too, right? There you go. So, uh, so uh, you, know, you, you realize that as you're running up this downward moving escalator that as hard as you, you, you can't walk up, because if you walk up, you end up at the bottom again. And if you run up, it's not enough to run up like in medium speed, you gotta go really fast to try to get to the top. You gotta use every single ounce of energy you have to push yourself beyond the downward inertia that keeps drawing you back down to that first floor or back to my mother at the time, right? So I, I figured out, I found the strength, I found the courage, I figured exactly how fast I needed to move my legs and how to move beyond the power of the escalator itself. So um, you get to that point and it's super ambitious and you break yourself out of this downward pressure. Now think about that image for a moment. Okay? Something pulling you down, right? Matzah is symbolic of the conquest of that downward motion. Now, if you're baking matzah, it's the exercise is moving super fast, moving beyond the clock. You're always racing against something. Time is something that's always present, right? I actually did a Quora search before I came here, like what's faster than time? Anyone know, anyone know what's faster than time? Right? The truth is, time doesn't move, I found out. Time does not move. Time is not moving at all. There's a flow of time. We think of the flow of time, but time isn't going anywhere. Right? Although, I saw a lot of interesting answers. My favorite, the, my favorite answer to what's faster than time are thoughts are faster than time. That in an instant, you can think of something and be in another place, no matter where you are. That there's something profound about ideas in your mind. And, I, and, it, and it, it got me thinking a little bit about, you know, why we create a seder, an orderly um, telling of a story of us escaping from Egypt. We'd have, we, say, we have something called the Haggadah that tells the story. We have something called Sipur Yitzhi at Mitzrayim, telling the story. And it all has to do with our thoughts and our mind. And these things are things that allow us to transcend space and time, beyond space and time. Now, we know that the Torah tells us that if you shmor et ha matzot, you have to watch the matzot. And Chachamim tell us shmor et matzot teaches you also shmor et ha mitzvot, right? In the same way, they got to safeguard the matzot, you got to safeguard the, the, the mitzvot. What's the correlation there between matzah and mitzvot, right? It's, it's the same concept. Chachamim tell us when you have a mitzvah haba leyadcha al tatzmichena. When you have a mitzvah that comes to your hand, don't allow it to become sour. Do you know what I'm talking about? When, you have, when you're about to do something, you get excited, this new thing that you want to do, and you want to try something, and you order it, and it comes, and you open it up, and then you get distracted, and you're like, eh, I'll deal with it later, and then it's gone. The excitement, the inertia, the desire to want to go ahead and conquer this new thing is completely gone, right? This is the nature of our reality, right? Is that time is always, flo it doesn't flow, it's there. How you respond to time matters. How you interact with time matters. You choose what the time looks like. You decide what this moment in time looks like. Not time itself. It's true if you're coming to the Monday night classes and you're learning about the zodiacs, you'll learn that the time itself has an influence on you. That yes, it has this cosmic you know, rays that shoots down and, and forces your personality to be a particular kind of way. But if you've listened to the classes carefully, you know that those things don't define you. They influence you. They don't determine what you are. Life has a natural gravity. It's called time. 
and if you do nothing with it, you get sucked down on that escalator. You're always going down. If you don't have clear purpose, you don't have clear direction, if you don't have seder in your life, if you don't have a story, a sipur to tell, you end up going nowhere. It doesn't matter what happened way back when with our ancestors 3,300 years ago leaving Mitzrayim. It doesn't matter. But you have to have clarity. It's not an accent of the word sipur and sapir. To enlighten are the same root word. Every time you tell the story itself, what happens? You expand your understanding of time, my friends, because you're a part of it. It's your story. We have to see ourselves on this night, on Friday night, as if we left Mitzrayim. Our own Egypt, our own places of servitude, our own things that are holding us back, the things that are holding us back in time. How do you break free? You gotta tell your story. Now, there's this fascinating uh, article that I saw that was written by a uh, professor of history named, um, his name is Henry Abramson. He's got all these uh, stuff on YouTube, whatnot. He tells a story that in the 1920s, the Soviet Union actually printed Haggadahs. They're called the Red Haggadahs. Anyone familiar with this? It's a fascinating story. Okay, so the communists were um, realizing that the only way to kind of get the whole of Russia to convert and move into communism and socialism was through crazy propaganda. So they, they, they took these Jews who were total communists and gave them a budget. They even had a rabbi named Shimon Demenstein, okay, who, was, uh, who created a program of anti-Jewish propaganda. And he was the uh, author of something called the Red Haggadah. Okay, so basically the Red Haggadah was a Haggadah that took all these Jewish concepts and turned them into communist propaganda pieces. So my favorite one, I have two favorite ones over here. So one is we know that we read Avadim Hayinu Leparob Mitzrayim, right? So it says Vayitzainu Hashem Elokeinu Misham Biyad Chazakah Vzredetuya that God took us out of Egypt, right, with a outstretched arm and a mighty hand. The Ilo Itziu Hakadosh Baruch If God did not take us out of Egypt, who have attained Mitzrayim? we would still be slaves to Paro in Mitzrayim. Right, we say this. This is our response to the Manishtana. Uh, okay, so listen to how they, how they translated this, okay? They said of this. Okay, the official Soviet Union could not tolerate this kind of a passage, right? They changed it in their Red Haggadah. to read, it read as follows. We were slaves to capitalism until October. Right? Soviet shorthand for the Communist Revolution of 1917. They led us out of the land of exploitation with a strong hand. And were it not for October, we and our children would still be slaves. This was the propaganda of uh, the Russians in the 1920s. By the way, this wasn't in Russia. This was actually in Ukraine, irony. So instead of God destroying the Egyptian army, the Soviet got to descri describes the success of the Red Army. Right now, what's interesting is that um, oh, my other one is, you know, instead of saying, you know, Bashan HaBab Yushalayim, they would say, you know, Bashan Ha, this year, you know, they said, this year we have a red revolution in our land, and next year we have a world revolution in, the, in our lands, right? It wasn't enough to go ahead and, like, take these ideas and, like, you know, um, just hear them and learn about them, but to bring them into the most private parts of our lives, the home on the said there. Now, so this is interesting, right? So, how many Jews actually read this stuff? And the answer is hundreds. Now, can you imagine how many Jews there were today in Russia that did not believe that the Russian army was actually attacking, uh, or was actually attacking the Ukrainians because they were trying to cleanse it of Nazis, Nazi elements in, in the Ukraine? That, that there are parents today who had their children in the Russian army, and the kids are in Ukraine, fight, you know, who are in the Russian army calling their parents saying, this is an unjust war, and their parents are saying, stop being crazy, you're, you go out and do your, do, do, fight for Mother Russia? How do you have that? How do we live in 2020, 2022, right, in a world where uh, we have such access to information, but yet so much disinformation? How does that happen? How do you have people today alive who could look at what's happening and say, oh, it's okay, it's good. Putin's doing the right thing. People getting up in, their, in, in his country and saying, like, this is a great war. Like, we, have to, we, have to, we have to take over and cleanse Ukraine. How does that happen? How do Jews in the 1920s read and accept the second Can you know how many students I've had from, the, uh, from, from, uh, from Jews from the former Soviet Union whose, whose parents did not tell their children that they were Jewish, who were embarrassed about it? How did that happen? I'm very proud of it. 
You're here, you must have some pride, that's why you're here. But this room should have five times the amount of people in it, right? Where's everybody? So what happened? How did these people buy into this uh, propaganda? And you have to understand it like this, okay? The Haggadah ends, this, this passage of Avadim Hayinu ends as follows. It says, Even if all of us were wise, right? we have deep understanding, we're, we're, we're elderly, we're all aware of the Torah, we have a mitzvah to tell the story. If you don't tell your story, you can be convinced of anything. If you don't know what you stand for, you will fall for anything. The Haggadah, the night of Pesach, is all about getting clarity as to who you are and to where you're going. Oh, it's hard, Rabbi. It's so much time being Jewish. It's exhausting. I got to find the right kind of clothing, the right kind of food, kosher. It's complicated. Yeah, maybe. Maybe it is. But it's a choice you got to make. See, there's two kinds of people in this room. The people that are going to get up and be zariz, they're going to have alacrity. They're going to get up. They're going to run. They're going to fight the downward escalator. They're going to overcome that downward pressure, or they're going to allow themselves to succumb to it. That's all it is. To know what is emet requires exploration, requires effort on your part. It means going up sometimes in Snopes.com and questioning what, your, what Snopes even says. Right? It doesn't mean accepting the things that you hear. It means overcoming. It means putting in effort and energy in your part. It does not mean going with the flow. That's destructive. How do you say uh, time in Hebrew? Zman. Right? It was interesting. The bracha that we make, right, in the Kiddush is Baruch Atah Hashem Ankenem Echola, Mekadesh Yisrael, Vahazmanim, and the times. But why do we say Hazmanim? Why do we say Mekadesh Yisrael, Vahamoadim? It's a moed, in fact. Why are we calling it time? Why are we saying it's Zmanim? It's a strange thing. What is Zman and what's the difference between a Zman and a Mo'ed? So this Hazmana, word Zman, right, an invitation, it means it's something that's designated for a specific purpose. So for example, we had uh, on Sunday here, we had, a so, we had Sofrim coming here checking our tefillin. So before you're going to make a uh, tefillin, you have something called Hazmana, where you dedicate a particular hide for a particular purpose. And once it has given that Hazmana, once it's been designated for a specific task, it can't be used for anything else but for the tefillin itself. So Zman isn't a flow of something, it's a designation of something. Right? Where you are mazmin to a wedding. Right? We're setting aside a time where you are coming to this wedding. It's a hazmana, it's an invitation. Now, hazmana is something that's dedicated to a higher purpose, has a higher function. So we, we think of it in the same way as kedusha, as holiness. Right? The word kadosh also is tied to this word hazmana. So for example, when you go to a, a wedding, Right? The, when a woman is mikudeshet, she receives the ring, you say mikudeshet, mikudeshet, mikudeshet. What happens at that moment? She becomes designated to her husband and him to her and to them alone. Right? That is a mazmin. Okay? We're inviting another to an event. A specific time. That's when the event will occur. Whereas a moed is a destination in time. Zman is the designation. Right? The movement in a direction, and the mo'ed is the destination. Right? It ha we're always moving, my friends. The world is always moving. Everything around you is always moving. Reminds me of a very old Superman episode where Superman was stuck behind a, uh, a uh, he was in a jail cell, and the bars were made of laser krypt kryptonite. Right? And he couldn't get out, like he's stuck. So what's he gonna do? Right? He can't get out. So he's in there with Lois. He's like, Lois, you know what I could do? I could move, my, I could, I could move myself fast enough where if I, move my, if I vibrate my body fast enough, you saw this one? Right now? So uh, he's like, yeah, I know that one. Anyway, vibrate my body fast enough, my, my, uh, the atoms in my body will become like someone dislodged and I'll be able to like, just phase through the kryptonite. And that's how he escapes. He moves really fast, and his body starts to like, turn into particles, and he pushes himself out, and he's able to get out somehow. You know, I don't understand how that worked exactly, but it worked for him. And I think of it, and I think of time in this way, okay? You see, there's something called nature and time. 
okay? And it is influencing you. You do nothing, it will determine everything, that, you know, everything about your reality. You see, you think that you're more free than the Russians, but you're not. Because you are also a slave to the culture that you're in. You're also a slave to the environment that you are in. You're a slave to all sorts of things. Pesach is about breaking out of those constraints. It's about asking the questions. That's why the whole entire night of the Haggadah, what are we doing? We're asking questions. Why? To teach you a super important part of life. That the quality of your life is an expression of the quality of the questions that you ask. So what is time? Time is an opportunity. It's, a, it's an invitation to do something powerful. This particular time in history is unique. It's special. The days before Mashiach, as, as, as uh, Rabbi Hajjah was speaking about, require special souls. There's never been a generation before us that has been tested the way we have been tested. And it's not over yet, we're still being tested. The thing that we need to master in our generation is time. And the first key to understanding time is that there's two parts to it. Number one is that sometimes you gotta allow time to process. You gotta slow down, smell the flowers, and blow the soup. <sighs> right? You gotta, sometimes you gotta slow down. But just remember, that's very dangerous. If you stay there for too long, you'll get lost in Egypt forever. All the miracles couldn't take you out. After you've been able to process, once you're clear about how much time you need to absorb, you've got to speed up. You've got to speed up. You've got to find the inertia, the power to break out of the nature that you are in, or otherwise you'll forever be a slave to it. That is what the Hag is about. There are people that are literally flowing through rivers of time. Right? It's interesting. When we say, Bereshit bara elukim et the beginning of time represents a break in nature itself. The Yavanim bought into this, pro this idea that the world always was. It's not an accident that the word Yavan and Gil uh, Galgal have the same exact gematria. The wheel is always turning, right? They always believed in the universe. And nothing changes. It's always going to be the same. You can't break out of it. But that's not true, my friend. That's the lie. The servitude that we, break, we, broke free from, we, break, we broke free from was this concept that things don't change. This is why the first mitzvah we got as Jews was a new moon, a new month, a new opportunity, a new mazal, a new beginning. We are going to experience a powerfully profound Pesach, right? The world is changing, my friends. If you, and I don't know about you, but for me, I feel like it's speeding up. And not an accident that it happens in the springtime, Pesach, where things literally feel like they're moving. Right? Winters always feel long. Summer, springs always feel short. There's a reason for that, because there's opportunity here. Capitalize on the opportunity for growth. Tell your story. Know where you came from. Don't allow yourself to settle. Don't be at the bottom of the escalator. Fight hard. Push beyond that downward mobility. Just remember, the word mo'adim, is also tied to regalim, the regel. Why do we call it the regel? Right? Because we're supposed to be moving towards something. Where are you going? Ask the questions. If you don't ask the questions, you'll be stuck forever. But if you ask the questions, you'll be able, my friends, to hear the regalim, the footsteps of Mashiach, hear the footsteps of a world where we recognize how every single moment in time was a necessary moment for you to overcome something profound so you could express the greatest version of yourselves. But be mindful. In that same time, you'll also have to deal with the guilt of not using every moment profoundly. May you be blessed with the clarity and understanding that every moment is so precious. That every single moment that we have is a unique opportunity to do something profound. That time is free, but it's priceless. You can't own it, but you can use it. You can't keep it, but you can spend it. And once you've lost it, you can never get it back. Have an amazing Pesach, everybody. Thank you so much for listening. Have a great night.